Now on to the final message of our series called Beyond Mud Puddle Gods. You know, through our journey over the last few weeks, we wanted to contemplate the nature of God and consider how that impacts the way we worship God, the way we understand God, how that in- impacts our understanding of even how we're called to relate to each other in community. And we wanted in this series to move people from what we call a simple sort of mud puddle understanding of God and move them towards the ocean. Take them out to the beach and get them to look out onto the ocean. And I have to admit, as we in this series have tried, we've tried to get all of us to stand and look out from the shores of the ocean, so to speak, and read the map of the ocean, and that would be God's word, And we have hopefully discovered this in this series of helping us understand the God that we worship and the God that we're called to know. And it's this. Christianity is alone among the world faiths that teaches that God is triune. He is a three-person nature of God. Um, The doctrine of the Trinity is that God is one being who exists eternally in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And if we're going to worship God, we have to relate to God as the Father and as the Son and as the Holy Spirit. That is the nature of true worship of God. Now, please understand that as we talk about the Trinity or about the um, three-person nature of God, this is absolutely profound. And I got a sense, I I was away last weekend, it was my weekend off, and we had a wonderful opportunity, and those of you who come on Saturday night got to hear Brent uh, Hudson preach live on this, but he really took us, he he took you out for a ride there, out on the ocean, I want to tell you, as he really got you to contemplate about what does this three-person nature of God mean? How, this, how God relates to himself as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and how their uh, pure, unified, loving community among themselves and within themselves um, is, is what our vision of what it means for us to be in community. And um, one of his big ideas, though, was this. The life of the Trinity is characterized not by self-centeredness, but by relational, mutual, self-giving love. That, that, that in fact, I, I, let me read a quote from Timothy Keller on this. He says, each of the divine persons centers upon the others. None of them demands that the others revolve around any of the others. Each voluntarily circles the other two, pouring out love, delight, and adoration into them. Each person of the Trinity loves, adores, defers to, and rejoices in the others. And this creates in the Godhead a dynamic, pulsating dance of joy and love. Now that's a big quote. But the point is this. This has an implication of our understanding of God and our understanding of reality and how we're called to live life. Because what we have to understand is that at the center of the universe, if at the very center of the Godhead is this mutual self-giving love, then at the very center of the universe, self-giving love is the dynamic currency of life. God is triune, then that means loving relationship in community are the great fountain, the center of reality. You know, when we say God is love, I think sometimes we really reduce what we're trying to say because I think sometimes we say, well, that means love is just really important or that God really wants us just to get along. But in the Christian conception of God, God really has love as his essence. The purpose of God is essentially, eternally, interpersonal love. Now, this has a profound implication for all of us as we move beyond a mud puddle understanding of God and move out into the ocean. The profound implication is that ultimate reality, then, is a community of persons who know and love one another. That is what the universe, God, history, and life is all about. Let me quote Keller again. He says, if you favor money, 
If you favor power, if you favor accomplishment than over relationships, you will dash yourself on the rocks of reality. I mean, when Jesus was asked, what are the two greatest commandments that was revealed by God, Jesus says, one, what was the first great commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. And he said, and the second commandment is what? Love your neighbor as yourself. And he says, and then all the rest of the law, all the rest of God's revealed will to, to us hangs on that. But did you catch that? The ultimate center then of reality is love. Because the very essence of God is love. I mean, that is why even Jesus, again, here's another way Jesus expressed the very love of God. He says, he said, if you really want to find yourself, you have to lose yourself in loving, sacrificial service to one another. Because he was simply saying, this is what I, the Father, and the Spirit have been doing before the times of eternity. This is what real reality is. Lose yourself in loving, self-giving, sacrificing love towards one another. You know, we believe as Christians that the world was made by a God who is a community of persons who have loved each other for all of eternity. Therefore, you and I were made as well for mutual, self-giving, other-directed love. You know, one of the great statements that we try to say to people when we say, what's life all about, is this. God made me to love me. And, and the reason was is because God himself was, was love, and, that, and out of that love came this creative expression where God then wanted to also love those who he created. That's what we were designed for, to experience this loving, self-giving union between God and his creation for all of eternity. That is the very essence of reality in life. And that is why we have as our mission statement as a church that we want to lead people to love God, love others, and follow Jesus. Now, we say follow Jesus first, but, then we, but, but the point is why? We follow Jesus so we may experience the love of God and we may express love to others. We say that is the very center of reality because that's the very center of God's reality found within the Trinity. Now, when we say all this, please understand something then. This has a profound implication as we understand the love of a triune God to us. Self-centeredness then destroys the very fabric of everything that God has made. You know, this is one way to describe what our greatest problem is. You know, the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the very glory of God. Now, sin, the most simple definition of sin, simply means this. Sin means missing the mark. But you got to ask yourself, what mark does sin make us miss? What mark does sin make us miss? Well... That mark is to love. Because think about it. The mark we've missed is that we've turned the universe upside down by making self-centeredness the goal of life. We want to go our own way when we refuse to give ourselves in love to God and to others. I mean, in essence, that's what happened in Genesis 3 when we read about the fall. It's when Adam and Eve said, God, we don't trust you. We want to do our own thing, and we're not going to love you and obey you right now. We're going to just love our own agenda. So we're going to eat of this fruit, and we're going to disobey because right now we love ourselves more than we love you. And you know what happens when, when we make self-centeredness the center of our reality? We become stationary. And 
when our relationship with God then becomes unraveled, because now we're not moving in love to self-giving love towards him anymore, all of a sudden everything else starts to disintegrate. You see, self-centeredness creates psychological alienation. It makes us nothing, you know, be, let's be honest. Um, a person all wrapped up in himself makes a pretty small package. Um, nothing makes us more miserable than self-absorption, the endless unsmiling concentration on our needs, our wants, our treatment, our ego, uh, what is our record. In addition, self-centeredness leads to social disintegration. It's at the root of the breakdown of relationships between nations and races and classes and individuals. And finally, even in some mysterious way, humanity's refusal to serve and love God has led to our alienation from the natural world as well. You see, this type of self-centered sin turns us from God. And and the Bible then goes on to say this type of self-centered sin makes us dead makes us lost, makes us eternally separated from God. And, and therefore, then, the Bible says our greatest need is to be saved from this self-centered sin so that we can know the love of God and that we can learn to love again, so that we can be restored to what we were once originally created for, to be loved by God for all of eternity. You know, as we come to this Christmas season... What is the heart of the reason for Jesus' birth? Well, you just got to turn to Matthew 121. It says, and she will have a son, and you're to name him Jesus. And hey, does anybody know what the word Jesus means? He will save. The Lord saves. Um, that's exactly it. The Lord saves. And, and notice this. And she will have a son. You're to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. You see, never forget, we are the reason for the season. Jesus came to provide us salvation from our sins, to save us from sins, from that self-centeredness that will destroy our souls. The heart of Christmas is about God's then great work of salvation. So, So here is the connection we need to make about salvation and the three person nature of God. I first of all want to read a, a, a verse, a very simple verse found in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. So let's just go to that slide. God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much. Now remember, we're saying the very essence of God is love. Our self-centeredness has broken us away from him. But because of the very essence of God, he reaches out to us in mercy and love. And you know what that tells me then? It tells me simply this, that, that our salvation is rooted in the love of the triune God. Our salvation is rooted in the love. Our salvation, please understand, our salvation did not occur because somehow we had demanded it or we earned it or somehow we were simply entitled to it. No, it came simply because the great love that was already existing in the very nature of God. So let's conclude this um, message by just considering for a few moments this great love of the triune God. The first thing about this love of the triune God is this. It's it's a self-giving love. I've already touched on this, but let me just unpack it just a little bit more. It is a self-giving love. This love of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit worked out our salvation, was not done to benefit them. Isn't it funny so often that we'll love others because we think it still brings some benefit to us. But this love that was worked out by the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit to work out our salvation was not done for any benefit of them. It was done because they wanted the love that they knew, they wanted to express that love to us. And therefore, this love compelled them to action. And you see, that's one of the things that we have to, first of all, really grasp when we think about God's work in saving us. He moved to a place of action. You know, there's this great quote in, in about self-giving love I came across. It says this, in, in self-giving, if anywhere, we touch a rhythm not only of, of creation, but of all being in reality. 
For the eternal word also gives himself in sacrifice. When he was crucified, he did that in the wild weather of his outlying provinces, which he had done at home in glory and gladness. From before the foundation of the world, from the highest to the lowest, exists to be abdicated. And by that abdication, it becomes more truly self, to be thereupon yet more abdicated and so forever. This is not a law which we can escape. What is outside the system of self-giving is simply this. It is hell. That fierce imprisonment in the self. Self Self-giving is the absolute reality. So the first thing we have to understand about this love of the triune God that saved us, it's a self-giving love. And that should now start to shape our understanding of love. Now, the second idea about the love of the triune God that saved us, it is, it is a, what we call a saving love. The Father, we are told, planned it before the world began. And then the Son came and he paid for our sins. And then finally the Holy Spirit propels us to believe and work out um, our salvation in our lives about what it means to know and to love God. In fact, let's just go through it. So here's here's what the saving love did. The Father, let's just bring that slides up. Waiting, Father plans. Next one. Son pays, and the Holy Spirit propels. That's what saving love looks like. That's how the Trinity worked out our salvation. In fact, here's here's another way that has been stated by by someone else. It says... um, um, the saving love of God is to say that the origination of salvation is with the Father, the location of salvation is in the Son, and the presentation of salvation is by the Spirit. But all of it is done for the glory of God. The Holy Spirit, the Son, and the Father are all working together, fulfilling their role in order to save us. That's what saving love looks like. And finally... We must say that the love of the triune God that saves us is ascending love. I mean, think about this. The Father sent the Son. God so loved the world that he gave or sent his one and only Son. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. But then we also read that the Father and Son sent the Spirit in order to come and to to present to us, to testify us, the truth that's found in in what Christ has done. And then finally we read that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit sends us, the church, into the world to preach the gospel, to tell the good news, to share the hope of God. You see, the love that God did for us to save us was not only a self-giving love, not only a saving love, it was a sending love. You see, that means then that ultimately... We, too, have to be ascending-type people. We can celebrate with the Susies and go, they left their middle-class lifestyle, sold their home, gave up the comforts of a North American world, moved to Rwanda in order to be able to live out the gospel and help people do ministry there. But here, listen, this Christmas, I believe God calls all of us to be sent. If we know the love of God, we need to be sent maybe across the street to that neighbor who does not have God's hope in them. We need to be sent to a family member who we know is far from God and is right now absorbed in self-centeredness. We need to reach out to all those around us and just share the hope that we have in Christ. Well, as we come to a conclusion here about the three-person nature of God and we think about the salvation that he worked out for us, Let's never forget, ultimately, what the good news is that we want to share with people. The good news is that God, who is more holy than we can imagine, looked with compassion upon people who are more sinful than we could possibly admit or even know, and sent Jesus into history to establish his kingdom and reconcile people and the world to himself. And then Jesus, whose love is more extravagant than we can measure, came to sacrificially die for us so that by his death and resurrection, we might gain grace, his grace, what the Christian scriptures define as new and eternal life. And then we would say the Holy Spirit of God now works within us, inviting us to know forgiveness, peace, and eternal life. 
Now, please understand, this is the good news. This is the gospel. This is our about being saved. And all of this is possible because of the great love of the triune God. It was the Father's deep love for us that made the plan. It was the Son's amazing love that took my place for my sins. And it's the Holy Spirit's act of love that strives to bring us to a place of trust in the Son's work, which fulfills the Father's will. You know, my question simply to you is this. Are you, when you come into a place of worship like this, and we talk about worshiping the triune God, are you discerning right now God's love moving towards you and encircling, encircling you with that infinite self-giving love? Do you feel it, or have you been just so self-centered that you're still just pushing it away? You know, this love of God invites us to put our lives on a whole new foundation. The very love of God invites us to make him the center of our lives. We're, and we can now stop trying to be our own Savior and Lord. Instead, we can accept both his challenge to recognize ourselves as those self-centered sinners in need of his salvation and his renewing love as the new basis of our identity. That is why we exist. God made you to be loved. God made me to love me. And guess what happens? When we know that love of God, and that love is expressed in mercy and in forgiveness and in grace, we won't now need to prove ourselves to others. We won't need to use others to bolster our fragile sense of pride and self-worth. In fact, now we're going to go out into this world expressing that love, sharing that hope, showing that forgiveness, seeking to show peace, bring wholeness, bring justice, speak truth, and serve because that is the love that compels us because we have met the very triune God and have experienced his love. And now... We can then simply pray this. Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, set up your kingdom in our midst. Lord Jesus Christ, son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Holy Spirit, breath of the living God, work within me, renew me, so the whole world is renewed. Amen.